Good morning, everyone. Um, we're here at Brandon University. I'm Bill Ashton, the director of the Rural Development Institute. Uh, we're here to um, talk about, listen to, and then discuss um, integral strategies, both in, for community engagement. And we're going to hear more about that um, as we go forward from the two presenters. Um, we're certainly glad you've joined us um, here at, at the university. And for those online, um, I'm glad you're online as well. There's going to be likely to be others joining in online as well. Uh, we've hoped today what's different about one of this presentation is, is that we're um, enabling everybody to have the conversation uh, live. So you're able to use uh, your mic um, on if you're online. Um, if you're not using your mic, just shut it off um, or mute it. Um, the speakers will be taking questions at the end of their presentation. So that's, that's the, the, uh, sort of the protocol of the day. The presentations are going to be lasting um, 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll follow that up with questions. Um, I just I want to thank the graduate students, uh, Otis, as well as Mike, to, to get us set up and get us all organized for today. Um, the question around community, um, um, thinking about strategies and thinking about, about sort of the, the systems approach, um, part of this has been a, um, here for a, a long time in terms of, of approaches to community development. I think what's really important today is, is that um, there is a, an approach that is, is got evidence behind it. There's a series of cases that we'll hear about in terms of making a difference. And the notion of integral in my mind is, is one of the key words, and Dave and I were talking about this earlier, is just how important um, getting the right pieces in place to implement, not only to have impact, but to implement with full engagement, with engagement with the community. So the people are in fact making the differences in their lives. I think that's what's important about and what we'll hear more about in terms of today. Um, and I think as an applied research center, that's often at the heart of what our goal is as well, is to be able to make sure that our research not only is a process of research and finding new knowledge, but understanding how to mobilize that and make a difference in the communities, uh, be it a geographic community or a community of interest. So let me leave it at that. Um, well, I've asked uh, Otis to, um, as a graduate student, to to get practice in terms of speaking and introducing. Um, so he, he's agreed to do that. He'll give a, a bit of, an, of, of some of his thoughts about uh, uh, community development and, and strategic uh, development or strategic planning. And we introduce the two speakers and then uh, we'll have the speakers. So thank you, Otis. Thank you, Bill. So th those of us in the room, we are privileged to have our presenters here today to present to us live from Brandon University. Thank you all for coming. I would like to give a brief uh, introduction of what the kind of uh, presentation is about today. So it's all about key engagement in terms of using uh, integral strategy in helping in community development. So we all know community engagement has been uh, times whereby community members have shared their benefits uh, and also their beliefs as to how people have the power to solve their community problems and also directing future growth and also change. This has been uh, strengthening civic infrastructure to enable communities uh, to prosper and also for communities to be vibrant places for people to live. So unlike uh, physical infrastructure, building communities civic infrastructure enables communities uh, also and also their members to discover civic infrastructure and also the opportunities and how people can connect with each other to solve problems and also make community decisions. So this has also been in areas like building awareness and also capacity building. So the presentation today by uh, Richard Falls and David Forrest will be on integral strategy, which has been uh, a sort of community development tool in uh, building, or let's say, community development in uh, some rural places in Ambera. So, integral strategy has been widely used to create transform uh, transformative change in communities, large and small. So, stakeholders join forces to contribute to their unique perspectives and also expertise. So, communities realize their full potential when people agree on a desired future and also collectively invest their energy to create it. Presenters from the Integral Strategy Network will share examples of places where the process has been used in uh, 
Rekas Kirin, Lubitz, Niski, and also Levy Bridge. So uh, our presenters today, uh, David Forrest, uh, is the founder of Integral Strategy Network. David studied ecology in university, and also he gained a deep appreciation for complex systems. He coined the term enterprise ecology in the early 1980s to describe the application of ecological principles to business competition, innovation, and strategy. David was one of the authors of the best-selling book, The Information Paradox. So we also have our second speaker today, which is Paul, who holds a Bachelor of Arts Honors in Economics and an MBA from the University of Cardiff. Richard has worked directly in economic development, also specializing in market research, analysis and business information in Cagri and the region for over 27 years. Richard has held several senior leadership roles at the Cagri Economic Development Authority, that's uh, CEDA. Richard first used integral strategy in 2003 with the Cagri Rotary Club, a project that was recognized with a Paul Harris Award. So without much ado, I will introduce our first speaker for today, David Forrest. Right. Over to you, David. Thank you, Thank you uh, Otis and, and Bill, uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about uh, this work uh, today. Um, the uh, Integral Strategy Network is, is a, uh, a group of, uh, of people who, who practice this methodology with communities and organizations uh, across Canada at, at this point um, around complex challenges. And really it's a different way of, uh, of working together and engaging uh, stakeholder communities around uh, a challenge that is significant for them. Uh, what all of these have in common is that they represent a, a wicked problem of some sort. So uh, really the, the process is, is a full life cycle of, uh, of uh, implementation from the upfront thinking about possibilities uh, and then through a dialogic approach deciding what the strategic goal should be uh, and representing that as a plan of action that can be addressed collaboratively. Uh, out of this dialogue emerges a sense of shared purpose and commitment. And this works across stakeholder boundaries. So many of these projects in, involve all sectors uh, around a shared problem. And it, it's, it's true, I think, today that, that wicked problems uh, require more than one actor to find uh, solutions. So in many of these, we engage with uh, government and, and uh, the business sector uh, and community organizations to, to, find, uh, to define a, a future that, uh, that they can create together. The focus is, is continually on outcomes and, and we represent, represent strategy as outcomes to be achieved. Uh, in the process, uh, in, in engaging the community too, uh, people make that commitment to participate and, uh, and contribute. And that unleashes the potential of the community in a, in a rather remarkable way. Uh, too much of the potential in this world is, is left unutilized. Uh, and when we find a sense of shared purpose together, uh, it opens the door to, to a, a lot of, of uh, deeper possibilities. It's, it's a, uh, a learning exercise as well, uh, as we'll see, that, that we can start with, with shared intention, but uh, uh, it, we really learn by doing. And so we can observe the effect uh, of the actions we take and, and learn from that how, how we can do things better or what may be missing from our original understanding of the system. So uh, some examples of the, the kinds of uh, wicked challenges that, uh, uh, that where integral strategy has been used. Uh, Community-based challenges like aging, how do you design an age-friendly community? Or childcare, 
uh, or active transportation, increasing the number of children walking uh, and biking to school, uh, diabetes prevention, and, and, and so on. Uh, in, uh, in government, this has involved uh, uh, projects in the health system. How do you increase the effectiveness of a provincial health system? Uh, obviously a very complex system. Uh, uh, or in another case, how do you develop a, a strategy to fund science? Uh, and, uh, and that engaged uh, provincial government departments. This was in Alberta, uh, provincial government departments and universities there. Uh, part of this is, is deciding what the goal should be, you know, uh, and, and that raises the question, what is, what is science? And then how do we make science more effective in the way that, that serves the interests of that community? And so on. So uh, in, in virtually every case, this has involved uh, large numbers of stakeholders, sometimes as many as, as uh, as 30 or 40 different uh, organizations and in, uh, in, in different sectors. Um, I tend to think of strategy not as a binder on the shelf or a process that we go through uh, once a year, but our DNA. So it's really who we are and how we act in the world. And, and the question starts there. You know, if, if the project is about uh, homelessness or food security, uh, then what is the intention that we should have about, about that thing and what, how can we make a difference? And, uh, and with this approach, really, strategy isn't written in a back room by some author and then passed down to the community to, uh, to execute. That doesn't work very well anymore. It needs to be co-created. And that's the power of, of harnessing uh, the assets of a community. And if we're talking about rural development, that means harnessing the, the full assets of a region towards some shared purpose. So every community or organization city or region has goals and aspirations and often it looks like this unsorted a jumble of things that don't really connect or or make sense how do you how do you tackle something like that so what the strategy roadmap does and that's the 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 artifact that we create in this dialogue is that it helps to connect the dots so on the right hand side here, the highest value outcome, what's the goal that we're trying to achieve? And then supporting that earlier outcomes and supporting that yet earlier outcomes and so on. So you end up on a single page with a representation of the goal and the chain of outcomes that are required to, to achieve it. that connects the dots and really this process is about connecting the dots uh, it's it's emergent so uh, there is no sense of what the structure may be at the beginning uh, it's the dialogue that decides what uh, what we choose to do now the clusters that emerge in this process actually represent something significant they are capabilities that are required, so strengths in the system that are needed to be successful. Um, you know, it may be greater innovation, it may be greater collaboration or whatever, and we can intentionally, uh, in, by connecting these outcomes, um, understand what's, what's required to, to achieve each of those capabilities. And at the end of the day, uh, at the end of this conversation, we can add the initiatives or actions that are required to achieve those outcomes. Now suddenly, uh, this roadmap of intentions becomes actionable because we're saying that if we do those things, then we will achieve the outcomes that we need to, to, uh, to realize uh, our strategic goal. And the question always is, so what? 
You know, who cares? Um, why should we care? What's the, what's the effect of reaching that, uh, that goal in a broader system? And so if we're talking about actions around, uh, around regional uh, development, then what are the benefits to individuals and, and uh, businesses and stakeholders in that, uh, in that region? Uh, this has been called by, by some collective impact. And if we have uh, dozens of stakeholders working together on the left-hand side of this roadmap uh, towards some shared purpose, then what's on the right-hand side is, is collective impact. So at the end of the day, it's not a binder, but it usually ends up on the shelf and ignored. It's a roadmap that uh, people often put up on the wall and use as a frame of reference uh, for their shared, uh, shared commitment. The, uh, the process is interesting and it, it still amazes me that uh, in four half day workshops, so the equivalent of 12 hours work, we can go from a blank page to clarity and concreteness. Now this is usually done over a period of time. It's usually about three months with, with time in between. Um, we record the, the dialogue conversations uh, with stakeholders and then take that away and, uh, and, and revise the map and bring that back into the, uh, the next session. So uh, along the bottom uh, axis, you'll see here great uh, confusion and, and fuzziness in the beginning but with the emerging understanding at the end uh, about, uh, about what it is we intend to do. And, uh, and up uh, bottom to top on the right is, is the way the roadmap looks in that journey. Uh, this was for a provincial health system. So not a simple system at all. Uh, and this was ultimately used by that provincial government to assess the effectiveness of its health, health budget, to make budgeting decisions. So that you could achieve that level of rigor in a four, four hours of, or four three hour conversations or 12 hours is, uh, is, is, is amazing. But uh, we see this uh, in every one of these uh, projects actually. When completed, the, the map then belongs to the community. And, and uh, our role in this process is to create the space for a meaningful, authentic dialogue uh, among stakeholders. And often uh, at the end of the day, uh, this uh, is presented to a larger group. So this was an open house that was held in, in, uh, in Lethbridge, Alberta and Richard will talk about this project and several others, where the, the community was invited in to, uh, to see uh, what had been created and to see how then each of the, of the larger community stakeholders could then contribute to achieving this vision. And in this case, this was the vision for an intelligent community. So leveraging the power of uh, connectivity and the internet to create uh, opportunity and quality of life. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the roadmap then um, represents strategy as outcomes to be achieved. That's significant because often we wave our hands in the air and, and, and we're talking about strategy and vision, but um, there's no real rigor or, or concreteness in what we're talking about. It aligns stakeholders based on shared purpose and stakeholders play a role in achieving each of those supporting outcomes, hence the, uh, the alignment. There's a clear goal. Uh, it's clear how the goal will be realized through the actions that are included in the map and it identifies the impacts and benefits. It, that's a starting point then. So the, the map it, it takes us 
to a defining intention. Now we have to act. So how do we act? By setting priorities, by making decisions about where to invest. So we have all of these things to do. Where do we start? And, uh, and where do we put our initial investment? Uh, agreeing on accountabilities so we can share the work. Who's going to do what? Uh, managing risk. And in this case, it's the strategic risk to achieving the goal uh, and therefore risks to achieving the supporting outcomes. Are there any outcomes where it's unclear or maybe less certain that if we take uh, action, we'll get the result we expect? Um, it's a tool for coordinating stakeholder effort. Uh, it maintains a focus on results. We learn by doing. So some people call this a theory of change. And in fact, uh, we have model that represents our understanding of the system. But as we engage with the system and do the work, are we seeing the results that, uh, that we expect to see? And if not, have we missed some essential action um, that we need to, to add or do we need to do something better? Uh, and we need to celebrate success. Uh, this is a collective effort. What's interesting here is that Perhaps it's easier to work within a single organization, but working in community with multiple stakeholders across sector boundaries is more challenging. And yet now we have a, a song sheet, if you like, uh, you know, that, that uh, where we can work together uh, and we should celebrate success as we achieve uh, results. So stakeholders contribute based on, on their interests, expertise, and ability to commit resources. This is really a self-organizing process. Uh, and it's amazing to see communities or, or regions self-organize around a shared, uh, shared purpose. Um, everyone's on the same page. So these four quadrants represent different stakeholders and the place in the system where they have chosen to work. Uh, and yet, when we all work together, then, then we're working toward achieving uh, a shared result. So I'll introduce uh, Richard Pauls, who will uh, talk about three examples of uh, communities where this has been used. Great, thank you very much, David. Um, and Welcome to participants, it's my pleasure to be here. I wanna share with you my personal experience with this methodology in three communities in Alberta. I wanna talk about the city of Wetaspin, which is a small rural city. Uh, it's about 7,000 people at the time we did this project. They had a number of folks engaged and we'll talk about those. The Leduc Nisku Economic Development Alliance is a band of communities on the southern half of Alberta, around Edmonton. Uh, centered around Leduc, but it has a city and a number of towns and villages as, as large as 13,000 people all the way down to 400 people, equals at the table. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Lethbridge Intelligent Community Project, which is a fairly large city in south, southwestern Alberta, again engaging their entire community and bringing them together to talk about what does it mean to be intelligent and, and actually do that better. Uh, so in Wetaskiwin, they had a number of uh, economic development uh, aspirations and they brought us in initially to develop and design a strategic plan for the development of the city itself. Um, and, and we undertook a number of community outreach uh, processes where we had focus groups and online surveys and public forums for the residents to come and tell us what they saw. And we undertook a significant economic development assessment and found to their dismay and our surprise that there was virtually no growth evident over an entire 10 year period. In fact, Wetaskiwin as a community was actually shrinking. Um, they undertook to hire full-time economic development staff to bring that together and that's what was the impetus for an economic development strategy. <clears throat> the significant public impact or input uh, provided the rationale that the city council needed to say, we need to do something differently here. It's, we cannot continue to do what we're doing. Uh, there was a call to action, and they felt that the goal you see here, the task one provides economic growth, a high quality of life, and advantages for future generations, is the goal that the strategy development process, the integral strategy process, 
That was the goal that they settled on. As a result of the dissatisfaction with the status quo and how things had been progressing in, in the previous periods. Uh, lots of identified areas of concern ranging from uh, homelessness to uh, social decay to uh, boarded up storefronts. Um, there was graffiti, the city was looked unkempt. Um, the, the business community was really coming together as a group to say, we drive the businesses here, our customers are not happy. If we don't do something about this, then we will actually go out of business and we'll no longer be able to hire the residents and there will go your tax base and all the rest of those. And so the businesses actually coalesced around this process and they actually demanded of city council a legitimate role as opposed to a public input process that one would typically experience where we ask you your opinion and then say thanks very much and, and, and do what it was the administration or the elected officials would have normally done. And, and business said that's not good enough. So their aha moment was business coming to the city and saying, we have created the jobs and the role of the city is to ensure that when we're ready to hire more people, that you're open for business and you make that easy. And the elected officials, to their credit, they agreed to develop the business, or implement the business development solution. So if business could come up with a solution, the city elected officials, they didn't guarantee it because of course they can't do that. But they did say that if you do this, we'll do our bit. And our bit is to make sure that we take you seriously and design and develop the solution. This is the Wetaskiwin uh, Strategy Roadmap. It was done in 2008, I believe. Um, as you heard earlier from David, there's a number of core capabilities that they wish to concentrate on. Uh, communication and celebration, vision and leadership, Relationship with Hobima, which is the First Nation to the south of the city. The, the participants included the First Nation, the city, the county, and a small community to the north of the town. And they all needed to be together. And so this was one of the first projects I worked on that had that First Nation and Aboriginal focus to say, they're as much a part of this community as everybody else. They need to be at the table developing a solution together. So instead of saying, well, no, your problem, go away, we want you as part of the solution. Uh, community engagement and community image, because as I said earlier, the community was in decay. They were very concerned about the image that they portrayed in the world. And as an economic development professional, you're competing with everybody else. And so you wanna have the best looking product with the best potential to succeed. And then last and, and probably most importantly, that, that economic development focus, the business development and growth of the local companies, uh, business investment attraction, and then the marketing of their community and their community opportunities and assets to the bigger world. It's a competitive world. If we don't have something to sell, nobody's going to buy. And of course, this was early on, so there's not as many of those downstream impacts as you'll see in some of the later uh, maps, but they were very conscious about quality of life, quality of jobs, quality of the future for their residents and for their children. Uh, the, the children of Wetaskiwin at that time on graduation, we're leaving town for opportunity because they didn't believe there was opportunity in the community. I'm happy to say they've now turned that around. Uh, industry developed it largely. There was substantial community input. Uh, there wasn't a lot of community at the table, although there was some. Uh, we had some health leaders, we had some faith leaders, we had social services, the police services were at the table, but it was predominantly business. Typically in an economic development strategy, it's driven by city administration and the elected officials. And they said, no, that's not the way to do that this time. It's gonna be business. So we had one city administration representative and one elected official to ensure that there was clear lines of communication back to the administration and the election, the elected officials, so that when they were finished, there was no surprises. They, they knew what was coming, they knew what they were going to be expected to do, and they were prepared to do that. Now, local First Nation participated to a degree and, and in countering full-on, full-blown economic development participation in a regional sense with First Nations, as you know, is difficult. It has some challenges attached to it, but we're happy to say that they were there with us. The businesses set the priorities. So the businesses went through all of those outcomes on the strategy map, all of these circles, and said to the city officials, 
these are the top six that we want you to undertake. And if you undertake these top six over the next three years, then we can make a difference with our community. We will have the infrastructure that we need to grow and develop. Uh, we will be able to attract uh, customers and we'll be able to attract employees. And that will give us the impetus to grow. And that will then support your tax base, which will then provide dollars for infrastructure development and it will become a virtuous circle. The city, to their credit, implemented and followed through on top three. So they paved the road to the airport and privatized it. Um, I can't remember what the other, the other two, but they were very careful not to try and do it all at once. They said, we've got limited resources, we can't do everything, so priorities are only priorities if you're doing a small number. If you're doing everything, it's not really a priority, it's a soup kettle. So they are still following the strategy to a degree. It's still, it's, they printed it four feet by eight foot and plastered it on the committee wall of the council. And so they're using it as a benchmark and a, and a dashboard of progress and they color code things as they move along. Um, they're not finished. And an economic development strategy for a community like this is a long-term game and they realize that. So that's a lesson for a small rural community on how they can bring their businesses and citizens together to make a difference for the future. So the Leduc Niskew Economic Development Region is a band of communities south of Edmonton. It encompasses a city, uh, three towns, a county, and four villages. The goal they came up with, they wanted, because they were in an investment attraction, this is an investment attraction program. This is what this one is. The region wanted a greater influence. So they were on the border of Edmonton, they're centered around the Edmonton International Airport, they didn't feel that they were getting noticed. And the goal they settled on was the region has greater influence, regional development is more effective, business investment is increased, and a community of communities is created that takes advantage of regional strengths and pres preserves unique community identity. Many of you will know that in regional economic and community development initiatives, the maintenance of your unique community identity is really important to your community. And so you don't want to be merged into one large pot. And this is very important to them. Um, this project was approached as an investment attraction strategy, as I said earlier. Uh, they wanted to attract greater business to the region to take advantage of the International Airport south of Edmonton. And there was a, a very early recognition that there was a lot of significant duplication being done by the economic development officers and the community development officers in these communities. And they believed that regional benefits for everybody could be substantially leveraged if they all work together. So if you do something, I don't need to do it and I can take the resources that are freed up by doing that to do something else. And so there was a, understanding that the individual community voices weren't being heard because they were so fractured and everybody was doing little bits of everything, but there was real no cohesiveness on how they were bringing that all together. <clears throat> Seven communities, including four mayors and reefs. So this was one of my first projects where we actually had the senior elected official participate in the development of the map. They were in the room and they did it with the EDO. So the elected community and the uh, uh, development community along with industry participation came together as a team and said what do we all need to do what are all the things that we need what are the levers that we have that we can pull to actually get this moving and get it moving in the right direction so having a mayor of a community of 400 people working alongside a mayor of a city of 14,000 was a huge breakthrough for them they had never done that before and they really did believe that it was really important um, having that small community have the same size of voice or the same weight of voice as the larger community took a, a huge shift in thinking for particularly the large communities. Um, I don't know if your community is like this or not, but it might be. And that is the, the big gorilla usually says, oh, we've got the voice and we're going to go this way. And you guys just come along. And that's not how this happened. Uh, all the economic developers from the region were involved and not everybody had economic development people. Uh, so sometimes the city um, manager was doing it off the side of his desk or sometimes somebody from the chamber was doing it. Uh, the chambers were all involved and they really did believe that together they could be faster, stronger and more influential, which is really what they set out to become. And their aha moment was they learned 
to trust each other enough to see that if I gave it up and you did it, I could trust you to do it well and I could go do something else. So they really did get that collaborative thing, that collective impact thing. They understood it and recognized that if they did it that way, they could do more with the same resource allocations that they had because they weren't spending more money. They needed to use what they had more wisely. <clears throat> this is their strategy roadmap. Again, it's an economic development strategy, so the capabilities that emerged were really not overly surprising, but some of the content within those was. So we had a business development, a business, business climate. They really focused on the business climate. So when a business is coming to town as an investment, they want to reach a climate where the the community wants them. They want to be welcomed. They want the red tape to be removed. They don't want unnecessary hurdles put in their way. So having all those communities undertake a business climate assessment and alignment about how we're going to treat businesses that are coming to town was a key court capability that they felt would make a difference. Now, business attraction, regional identity, seven communities all branded differently. They had no distinct identity that, across, that cut across all of them. They're now branded as the Alberta's International Region, is what they call themselves, all seven of them. Um, and they all bought into that brand. So that's huge. Uh, capacity, the capacity to do things differently. That's the sharing thing. You do it and I don't have to. Um, leadership, planning and performance, and again, regional influence. You see more impacts on the right-hand side of this map. We had moved down. This was done, I believe, in about 2011. We'd learned a lot more about the benefit of identifying the impacts of the work in the community because that gets more of the community bought in and understanding what they're going to get out of it because at the end of the day, we all, as citizens, that's what we care about. We don't care what you do. We care about how it makes an impact on us. And so it was becoming more important for us to articulate those with the people that were delivering them. Um, outcomes and lessons. So the regional approach with a division of effort and responsibility is in place today. They still do this work this way. People are different. Uh, the elected officials are different, but they've got groups that are responsible for certain elements of that economic development planning and delivery. Huge. A lot of increased regional influence and a greater voice for all. The, the voice of the 400 member community is the same as the voice of the county, which is 17,000 people versus 400,000, 400 people. Four communities, really small communities, ranging from about 1,000 to 400 on the far western side of the county, like literally out in the wilderness, works on this project. Three of the mayors and one of the EDOs worked on the project together and learned enough about the benefits of working together and sharing that they engaged us later to formalize a cost and revenue sharing model for the four communities because not any of those communities could deliver all the municipal services that their citizens were demanding and needed. Whereas if they did it together, you do the streets, you do the, the sidewalks, you do the water, you do the fire. And they went to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and got an exemption from the Alberta Municipal Government Act to do this. It's still in place today, working. Four smaller communities called the 3920 Alliance. So it's 39, it's on Highway 39 and it's 20 kilometers west of the, of the city is how they came up with the name. So the shared effort allows for much more to be accomplished in a much shorter time span and shared successes with lots of regional spin-off benefits. There's a strong recognition now that the businesses that can locate there and will locate there don't have to be in the city for everybody to benefit. Big outcome, big lesson. <clears throat> Lethbridge was one of the more recent ones. This was uh, completed late October, November last year. This is the goal they came up with. Lethbridge is a vibrant and thriving community that offers opportunity and high quality of life for people in the city and the region. Not surprisingly, many economic development strategies and, and projects come up with a goal that's very substantially similar to this, but they all look, as you can see now, radically different in how they're going to approach it. Uh, we undertook a significant interview process with the community of Lethbridge because they really didn't understand what an intelligent community was. They didn't know kind of what it was going to be 
and they wanted to make sure that they had the full spectrum of the community participating. And with this participatory dialogic based approach, you can't have 100 people in the room, it just doesn't work. So they wanted to make sure that we identified key stakeholders from the community that had a voice that needed to be heard, that could participate in the early days of forming this design team and the group that was gonna deliver the strategy on their behalf. We had 18 participants in the room that ranged across the entire spectrum, and I'll give you a, an overview of who those are in a minute. Again, four half-day workshops, same as they did in Metasquin, same as they did in Leduc, same as we did in Metrolinx, and one think-up event. Those are the photos that you saw, the community engagement event. They had, I think, about 75 additional organizations that came to that event and said, we are part of this community and we are active in your map and here's what we do and here's how it all contributes. The reason we did that, the way we did it with them, they designed this, they wanted, the, one of the executive sponsors was City Hall and the city, like many cities, was concerned that at the end of the day, their community would come forth and say, we need a million dollars or a hundred million dollars or 75 million dollars to do this and it's your job to do it and they were deathly afraid that that would happen here. And so we were tasked with this design team to understand the community impacts that were already being made so that the city could leverage those investments as opposed to make those investments. Very important thrust for this project. City Hall, economic development, the college, the university, social services, five different industry representatives representing key industries from the home builders to the construction companies to the food processors to the, the, the cattle and beef guys um, and so on. Students, we had student representatives. So the presidents of the students unions were there. Uh, the uh, volunteer youth advocate at City Hall was a part of this. We had the public library, we had the local museum, the downtown business association and the chamber all participated in this map, in this process. So it was literally a the, the composition of the entire community, including the volunteer group. Volunteer Lethbridge was part of the table. <clears throat> they learned their ha ha moment was, unlike what the economic development folks thought, that an intelligent community, creating an intelligent community and delivering an intelligent community is a lot more than just branding and marketing. It's really all about living and working differently. So their shift was wholesale. They went from, we're gonna design a brand, we're gonna design a tagline, we're gonna tell the world we're intelligent because of all the stuff we're doing, to how do we live and work differently together? Big shift, big shift. This is their map. You heard me say earlier that the city was deathly afraid of this multi-million dollar ask. So you look at the richness of this right-hand side of the map, hundreds of outcomes, hundreds of impacts that will be designed and delivered by investments that are already being made by the participants on the right-hand side of the map. Sorry, left-hand side of the map. So there's hundred and some odd organizations already on that side of this map working, delivering these impacts that are now measurable because they're all outcomes. And so the city says we can now quantify the community investment and our leverage is something in the order of eight to one. So for every dollar that we invest in the infrastructure to support an intelligent community, the community is making $8 of other investments to take advantage of that. So this is about using broadband wisely. As a result of this process with this community, the city then went on and commissioned a strategic assessment of broadband capacity to support implementation. They said, we know that the infrastructure is not gonna drive this strategy, and we know that this is not about technology, it's about using the technology and living with the technology in a different way. So we need to understand, because this is a necessary condition. Without this, you will not get an intelligent community and we know we're not where we need to be. So if you do the strategy and you tell us what you wanna do, we'll do the assessment of where we are and make the capital investment to bring that up to snuff. So they're now making capital investments in Lethbridge to deliver ubiquitous broadband capability to all of those communities in and outside of the city of Lethbridge. It's gonna take them some time to do it because it's not a trivial undertaking and it's a big community, but they know where they're going and they've got a dashboard so they can measure their progress and so celebrate that. 
Numerous community stakeholders have now accepted responsibility for these capabilities. So the college and the university came together and said, we'll deliver skills and literacy. That's what we do. We'll take responsibility for that entire capability area. We'll bring our budgets to bear. We'll bring our activities to bear. And we'll deliver that for our community with you. Um, Lethbridge was named that year as one of the finalists for a worldwide intelligent community recognition. First time ever. First time they've applied and they were recognized as one of the top 21 in the world. And the roadmap now provides an ongoing framework for them to set priorities and make investments and track progress across multiple organizations. I said earlier there's about 100 plus organizations actively involved in this map. The city doesn't control the budgets of any of those organizations. They all do that themselves. So now they've got a way of tracking how we plan our projects, how we sanction our work, and how we actually measure that against a community strategy that includes a whole bunch of other people that can't control what we do. So they really are all in it together. So uh, that's it for what I had to say. Um, I'll open it up, I think, now for questions, right? And before I do that, Bill, thank you very much for inviting us to be here today. And Otis, thanks for the technology. We appreciate it. And I'll see if I can get this working now. Right? How's that? Okay, good. So I think you can take questions both in the room and, and online. So sure. there's a question. Oh, no. Do you want to get in here? Yes. Okay. Yes, one uh, okay. So to uh, those of us online, we could uh, just uh, come out with our questions for uh, Dr. Richard and Dr. David to answer our questions for us. So we have the chance of uh, also those of us in the room to hear you out. So you could just unmute your microphones and just uh, speak into it and then we'll hear it here in the room. So uh, David and Dr. Paul will answer your questions for you. Thank you. Any questions in the room? To kick it off. So, yes. Right. So Wayne, Wayne Kelly here from uh, Global Development Institute. So the, the integral strategy, it's, I mean, it sounds like a really comprehensive strategic planning approach. Um, what is the, the, the you, you mentioned a couple of the key things that, you know, it's the, you create a roadmap. Um, I, I agree that the, identifying the, the impacts and connecting all of those is sort of a, a novel approach. And you, is there something else in terms of the, the actions? Was that actions to be, you know, on the map on the left-hand side, all the white circles, was that actions to be undertaken or is that actions that are already happening in the community that line up with their vision? So there's both actually. So, so integral strategies as a system is a full life cycle strategy development and delivery mechanism. So you've seen one of four products that deliver that. So the strategy road mapping is the planning piece of the action. Prior to that, a community with or without us would go through a visioning process where in which they determine the strategic intentions they want to work on. Lethbridge's case, it was we want to be an intelligent community that they need to adapt to and become. And the planning process, the integral strategy roadmap, lets them do that. And all of the actions and outcomes that you saw on the map were everything that that entire community felt needed to be done. Now, some of it was being done, some of it was not being done. There's an integral outcomes and action pathways process that follows the strategy roadmap planning program that prepares the community for implementation, which is where they set priorities and determine which need to be accelerated, which need to be started, which need to be finished, all of those things. Because as I said earlier, with that broader community, there's a whole bunch of things underway, but you need to know what they are. And if you don't know what they are, you don't know how to set a priority and you don't know how to make investments. And then integral outcomes actually executes on that. So getting the teams lined up, and making sure that they're executing properly on what they should be working on is a, a not inconsiderable challenge with that many players, right? So it's a full program. And in our role is one of coach and scribe. 
our role is not one of prescription. It's not about us telling you, well, you have to do this. It's here's how we can help you figure that out. And they figure it out themselves. It is their community. It is their process. So what would be, I mean, this sounds fantastic. I mean, in terms of how it'd be great to see a lot more communities taking this comprehensive approach to addressing what your problems facing them. What's the biggest challenge? Is it a resource challenge or is it like a state of mind or like a culture almost within the communities to, to start down this path? David, I'm sure, has some ideas. Of, I have ideas about that one, but I'll let David start with this and, and, and let you know his views of, of those because they're, that's a, a key question. Yes, uh, this, this is a cultural shift for sure. And in fact, um, you know, there's a maturity model here. So some organizations and some communities come in more, I'd say, at an entry level. Uh, and others may be more mature in their capacity to, to execute. And so the, the coaching and support that we provide is, is appropriate to that, that situation. But um, this is a real shift from the, we'll tell you how to do it approach. And, uh, and people have found that refreshing, I think. It's not without its challenges, obviously. So my opinion on that, just to add to what David said, I'm not gonna contradict him, there's, there's two pieces that are, that are just as important. One is that typically communities or organizations would hire consultants who would then come in and tell them what to do and how to do it. We don't do that. That's not our role. And that's a refreshing day difference. And from their perspective, from their side of the equation, it's a, a, a significant difference in leadership styles. Most command and control leaders wouldn't get this and wouldn't, buy into this at all. It's a real collaborative style. It's really about the leader recognizing the potential in the community and unleashing it as opposed to harnessing. So it's a real difference in, in how people work together and think together. So that leadership is pivotal. If you don't have that kind of leadership, you're never going to develop and deliver this kind of process. All right, I think okay. we also have uh, someone online. All right. Yeah, any question. It says, uh, it's from Kai, uh, Kai Whitfield, and he's uh, asking, do you think there are any limits to this model as in the integral strategy model? So Kyle, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we've only been doing this for about 15 years, so we're pretty new. Uh, it's a 15 year overnight success story, sort of. Uh, we have done this with uh, organizations or groups as small as eight people, all the way up to groups um, representing 45 um, organizations in the room simultaneously. David personally has done this inside a company with uh, 80 senior representatives. We did three of these strategy roadmap processes with that company simultaneously and then brought them together. So if that's the limits you're thinking of, we've not found them yet. Um, I'm sure they're there, uh, but we'd love to encounter those. David, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to add that this is not a conflict resolution process. Uh, there needs to be some shared attention at the beginning. You may not know precisely what it is you're going to do, but there needs to be some willingness to come together uh, and name a challenge and, and, and some willingness to work together. So having said that, we have not found conflict uh, in doing this work. And I think, you know, so there's some good intention at the beginning. Uh, I think the dialogic process helps and, uh, and people really do engage authentically uh, with each other. And I think focusing on outcomes rather than actions, typically, I guess, historically, traditionally, we've, we've you know, divided up the work. This is mine, that's yours. And that creates opportunities for conflict. So. Um, it, it works better this way. As Richard was saying, uh, there's a limitation of numbers. So this is not a broad community engagement tool. We get representative stakeholders to the table uh, and work with them and then scale it up in the community. So if you're, if you're hoping to engage with uh, 2,000 people, this isn't a tool to use in doing that. Now in Wetaskiwin, we did publish a, uh, a survey uh, uh, URL in the newspaper and solicited 
community input that way going into the process. Did that answer your question, Carl? In a way. Okay, glad to hear that. Um, so you've had experiences in multiple communities, different organizations, and different topics. Right. So, so there's great diversity in that. What's your sense of the root causes? And so this is more of a reflection rather than a, than a research, but um, why is it that, that these kind of strategic systems thinking pieces are needed when systems thinking has existed for years and years and years and years, right? So the application of it has existed. Um, I, I'm interested in, in your sense of the root causes of, of what's the space, because what you're talking about is relationship building in, in so many, many ways, right? What I heard on the examples was um, the communities, you're bringing communities together that work together, but they probably knew they should be together because as 400, uh, we can't do as much as 4,000 and collectively we could do something even more important. And those ahas that you pointed out are important of which that's going to be the energizing piece that keeps the, the strategy alive in their communities. But I'm interested in um, how do, is there stuff that at a rural development institute that we could be looking at around, have we lost our way? I'm trying to, if you can help us give some insights around that, about the sort of the cause, the root causes of why this is needed. Uh, have we lost our way? What, what do you mean by, by that? That uh, we're not seeing the results that we would expect or? Um, in some ways, you're talking about civic engagement with even yes. within an organization. This is, yes. you know, out of the 60s and 70s, this is, this is stuff that we used to do all the time. Yes. And, but, it, but there's something lot, there's something different now, or is there something different now that, and if so, what is that different? Okay. Um, I'm working on a book, so I'm thinking about these, <laughs> these things uh, a lot uh, these days. And, and we've inherited a lot of models from the turn of the century, industrial models, where it's transactional. We don't have the opportunity to, to think and, and, and converse together. So in that way, I think we, we have lost our way. In fact, I was listening to uh, a radio interview these days where people don't talk in the workplace anymore. Uh, so I think we've, we've lost community in, in that sense. It, it's interesting that in researching the book, there was a lot of attention being paid to systems thinking and even these styles of working in organizations back in the mid to late 60s. And then it seemed to have been lost, perhaps as we, we drove more and more to sort of bottom line results. Um, it, it does seem to me, and, and, and this was part of the puzzle, how, do you, how does this coexist with hierarchical systems? Uh, and it, there's been some writing recently about that Cotter's book, Accelerate, talks about a dual operating system. Uh, and Ralph Stacey talked about this in the 60s, that in fact, organizations and perhaps communities can uh, exist in two states. Uh, if the focus is on, you know, results and repeatability, uh, then we're, diff we're in a different state of mind than we are with creativity and innovation. And so if we're faced with challenge and crisis, we need to open up to possibilities and engage in this way. Um, if we're just trying to keep the lights, the lights on, um, you know, and deal in the moment, then that's a more transactional way of working. It seems though that the world has forgotten the other way of working and that, um, you know, it's more and more driven to doing things quickly and efficiently rather than looking at possibilities for uh, innovation. If I can just a supplementary question to that. So, so if one of the root causes that you're talking about is around efficiency, um, but we talked about it, what I heard was efficiencies. It's we're doing more with the same amount of resources. It's just how we're distributing the actions and who's taking responsibilities is, is, is broader than it was before. So that, that is part of that transactional stuff. 
Um, but it, but it, there's another layer, as you're talking about, onto the recognition, the cognition, the, the thinking part of that, and the relational part of that is much broader now of who's, who's involved in the problem and who's involved in the solution. We've enlarged that circle. That, that's right. I mean, once we have the answer, then we can sort of routinely execute. But if we're trying to innovate even around efficiency, then you know we need to step back and think uh, and, and think together about uh, what we can achieve together. It's interesting that, that the Gallup organization does a, a survey every year on uh, workplace engagement. And, uh, and they have found that uh, I think 15% of people in the workplace are actively engaged and appreciative of, of the work they're doing. And the other 85% are either disengaged or actively disengaged. And by actively disengaged, they mean sabotaging. So, you know, we've, we've, turned, we've turned off people in the workplace and in community, I think, um, by denying them uh, an active role. So the response that we've seen in, in working this way is that people will say things like, we don't have the opportunity to talk like this. We don't have the opportunity to, to, uh, to think this way. And it's, it's really powerful what can be achieved when we do that. Is there questions? Anything online? I don't hear anything. Can I just ask one other question? Sorry for the, uh, Richard, when you're talking about your your communities, mm -hmm. um, and I'll just relate a, a small anecdote first in Manitoba, and then and then to your question. Um, so 2012, we went through a massive, I think one of the largest municipal reorganizations in Canadian history, right here in Manitoba. Yeah. We, we reconfigured upwards to 120 municipalities. That, that is, is of no consequence. You know, there's, there's a lot of consequences following those kind of decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the process not dealing with conflict or dealing with intention. Um, but often municipalities um, have a long-standing history going head to head. Their baseball teams, their yeah. schools go head to head. And so we've designed this competitive piece of work across the civic, our, our civic lives around engagement and competition. Um, we've got great mas mascots that are angry at each other, that are all sorts of things. Our bobcat is not a sweet booty cat. Right? It's, yeah. You can see its fangs and its claws and everything else. And, and, and in the amalgamation process, those animosities, even before, towards the neighbor that grades the, the, the gravel road, that the quality wasn't good, that we can't amalgamate with them, they don't pick up their garbage very well, like all of the stuff that you would think, wow, but if you could do it with the bigger vision that you guys are talking about, that's for me sort of moves the discussion from conflict to opportunity. And I'm trying to figure out, given the groups that you did, there had to be some sense of that, even in the start and through the process, even though you say, okay, yeah. we got the intention, we're not in conflict, but that, that stuff just comes out in process. How did you deal with that? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that conflict, Bill. I would say that, you know, that the baggage of yesteryear, it comes and it's there. And it was at every one of these projects okay. that I was involved in, particularly the community ones, because they are competing uh, with each other for practically everything and 50 year relationships that went sour, mm -hmm. uh, they, they remember, they don't forget that. Uh, so that's where it comes really, really important for that different style of leadership to kind of bring that to the table and, and put it away and leave your, leave your baggage at the door, leave your title at the door, we're gonna come in and we're gonna to work together. And the vision of reaching an understanding of what you can do together has to be really solid and really profound coming from somebody who's influential in the community that can get beyond that baggage. Because it's there and it's not gonna go away and it's not really, it, we have one example in Leduc where we had a bully in the room 
And he was sure, bound bet and determined that your voice can't be as important as ours because you're never doing enough. Mm-hmm. And the community shut him down. Absolutely said, there's no place for that here. That's not what we're about. We want to get beyond that. And we know that the relationship was damaged some time ago. We can't fix that for you. You have to fix that for yourself. But if you can't, you're not welcome at this table. And they told them that. So they need to be given the space to do that. And they need to grow a community so that they trust each other to support each other to to get beyond that. But they can't. But it's not widespread yet. Not at all. Questions, suggestions? Um, just a question. Um, I noticed you outlined um, that when you were working with the um, Aboriginal communities, they participate so to a degree. Correct. So I would like to uh, know what, uh, to what degree do they participate and what are some of the challenges you face working to that degree? So I will be candid and upfront and, and tell you that the challenge was mine because I'm not Aboriginal. I've not worked in Aboriginal communities. And so I don't have, I don't believe, a deep enough understanding of what those cultural differences are. And so we were not able to uh, have them participate in our process because it was our process as opposed to their process or a process that they participated in designing together. So they came and they, they, they participated but they didn't really fully engage, in my opinion. And, and I don't blame them for that. It's just, we have not made, as white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the cultural shift that's necessary to engage those other nations in a wholesale way yet. And I'm guilty of that. I think it would go back to the question is, you know, what would benefit them? You know, what benefits would the community have? Mm-hmm. And that conflict and baggage, which I think that you mentioned, is frustration from years and years of wanting to do what they want to do because they know what they need and they know what they would like to do. And then collaborating with yourselves, for example, and hearing, hearing their concerns, hearing their voices, yeah. and working together to collaborate and coming up with a solution that's going to work. Yeah. It will work, so I they're, think. They're not, they're not used to listening yet. Is my experience. Well, not only that, but also being heard. Yeah. I yeah. think that's yeah. a big question. Yeah, so I hope we will have that opportunity. And, and, and we are, I would say, in dialogue with a number of First Nations communities about using this. I think there's, we will do a lot of learning in that process. But uh, what we've heard is that there's, um, I guess, some alignment between a dialogic way of working and working in a circle, which is what we do. Uh, you know, we're not uh, sort of facing each other across the table, but, but uh, and there's one voice in the room. So those are things that are important in, in indigenous culture. Um, and, uh, and I think there's lots to learn. Uh, they, they, they talk about it as other ways of knowing uh, there's lots we can learn from those communities. I, I think that in Canada, that's a, a significant challenge that we need to face together. Uh, and that means coming together in the spirit of listening. So. Yes. I need to ask, like, so based on your experiences with all the communities, so in moving forward, how would you recommend to be as part of the measures to promote the community and make that process happen? That's a big question, Mike. Um, yeah, so I think I heard you say, Mike, that what would we recommend as a process to bring communities together to work this way? Is that what I heard you ask? So the leadership is a key one, as I've stressed earlier, is getting the, the, the different kind of leadership, the leadership that wants to be participative as opposed to tell you what to do. So that's a key element. Uh, the second piece that I think is really important is recognizing really recognizing, not just paying lip service to, but really recognizing that community development is a team sport and everybody on the team needs to be there and they all need to be treated equally. That's really important. And, and that's not been a traditional habit of ours in community development, quite frankly. And so, and the last one is providing a, a forum where in which they can exchange ideas and, and test uh, opportunities in a real frank and candid way 
that is uh, has trust built in. So building that trusting environment where those new ways of working together can actually be taken advantage of as opposed to being dismissed. I think those are the three things that I would focus on. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions online? Other questions here? Sorry. All right. Let, let me thank you. Okay. That's all right. So let me just take just a couple of minutes to thank both of our speakers, David and, and Richard. Um, it, it's a great privilege both to be able to hear the 15 years of work in terms of what's gone into it. Um, I think the examples in many ways for me as a kind of a visual learner, um, speak my language in terms of we got some things on the table. Um, what I really like about the, the mapping of this is, is the notions of equality. My sense of it is, is that there was a lot of issues that were up there, there was actions that was, and consequences associated with it, and there was an equality across those depending, not, regardless of who they came from. Um, and so part of that is, is really um, empowering, I think, the individuals as you talked about. So what you, you walk the talk in many ways in terms of what you said this process was doing and what it was doing. In my mind, the results are, are where the key is and you're saying that communities are using these um, they're putting them, they're posting these, and they're, and they're using these as roadmaps. And so this notion of building trust in my mind, what I heard you talk about, um, in some ways, um, regardless of uh, what the root cause is, if we can get people in dialogue, trusting each other, in some cases building trust and rebuilding it, um, is often one of those things that sustain this kind of action. Um, and I just, I just applaud the, the efforts and really appreciate the, uh, the actions uh, that you guys have done and the commitments over the, the, the last 15 years. David, I'm going to hold you to the book. Um, <laughs> uh, when it comes out, let us know. Uh, we've got a, a great uh, distribution uh, possibilities around this. Um, we're involved, the Rural Development uh, Program is involved in a broadband project right now. Um, it is involved in a community-based uh, initiative, and I think this has um, uh, process has, has that kind of strategic thinking that we're envisioning around the community and around the lasting effect that while we will eventually pull out of the community, there's going to be some ongoing actions that we're anticipating. And so this embedding that, that commitment is really important to us as well. So again, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody online as well as in here. So thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you.